Good morning. Welcome to worship with us this morning at Acton Congregational Church. We are pleased to have you join us. No matter who you love or where you are on your faith journey, you are welcome here. A few announcements for this morning. The Social Justice Task Force is holding a food drive, which will be happening tomorrow, Monday, April 19th, uh, in the circle out front, um, in the parking lot, sorry, circle of the parking lot. And uh, the hours are from 8 to 10 a.m. and from 5 to 7 p.m. And they're particularly looking for coffee, instant or ground, sauces for marinating, condiments, spices, and can openers. But all uh, donations are, are welcome, and they will be delivered to the Open Pantry of Greater Lowell on Tuesday, April 20th. There's also going to be a virtual congregational meeting at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday, April 25th, to affirm the call of Andrew Harris as ACC's Associate Pastor of Congregational Life. We invite you to join us for that. Starting today, worship bulletins are once again available for Sunday services. Each Sunday, the bulletin will be distributed via email at 8.30 a.m., and it will also be posted as a link on Facebook at 9 a.m. And uh, you may print your own copy at home, or you can uh, follow along with the digital copy. And we hope that you will, because starting on May 2nd, we will no longer be uh, posting the text from the bulletin on the screen during our live stream. So uh, you have a couple Sundays to get used to it, and then starting in May, uh, be ready with your virtual bulletin or, or printed bulletin. Our prayer ministry team is ready to pray with you confidentially after our service, and we also uh, welcome you to join us for our virtual coffee hour. The links for both of these are available in both the Wednesday evenings and the morning e-news this morning. Join us in the spirit of worship. Amen. My friends, let us join our hearts and our voices together as we say the prayer of the day. God of Easter, this morning we gladly come together to praise you for the mystery of the resurrection. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Keep us passionate, O oh God about the Easter faith that energizes the work of the church on earth. We confess that too often we choose the ease of our religious rituals over the newness of the Easter faith. Forgive us, God. Turn our lives around and set our hearts alight with a yearning to be a faithful community of Easter people. Renew our hope. Refresh our wonder and nurture in us the longing to let Easter happen in our hearts today. Amen. Where shall I? All right. Um, good morning. I could not have asked for a better prayer to precede my 
little children's moment this morning because um, I want to talk about how it's been a couple weeks, right? So Easter's old news. Jesus died, we were sad. Jesus rose from the dead, we were happy, moving on, right? No. <laughs> we are Easter people, as Pastor Andrew just said, and we need to carry that with us. And we have ways that help us remember that important story throughout the year. And uh, one of those ways is with our communion, with the bread and the wine, which Jesus gave us to help us remember um, that very important thing that he did for us, dying to uh, give us new life. But I would like to share with you a, another way that we can remember and be reminded of Easter times and the importance that it has for us in our faith. So I have uh, brought with me a sound for you to listen to. So I'm going to play it, and my microphone will hopefully pick it up. Um, and I want you to think, have I ever heard this before? What could it be, all right? All right, so maybe you've heard it before. Um, Raise your hand if you think it sounds like ducks. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like ducks. However, this one isn't ducks. <laughs> this is actually a frog. Um, and this frog is called the wood frog with the scientific name Rana sylvatica. And the wood frog is a special frog. It has a special gift, a special ability. Uh, wood frogs spend the winter frozen solid. They do the impossible. Their bodies stop everything. Their heart stops beating, their lungs stop breathing, they freeze. So inside their cells doesn't freeze, but everything around their cells does. Um, and if we were to do this, we would be dead. And most animals, most plants, if they were to do it, they would be dead. But the wood frog, comes spring, it warms up again, and it's fine. And it's better than fine. It goes on a long journey to find a pond and find a mate, and if it's uh, a female, it lays thousands of eggs right off the bat after being pretty much dead all winter long. So for me, when I hear that sound in the spring when the, the wood frogs are calling, that's going to be a reminder to me of Jesus coming back from the dead for us and how miraculous that was. Now, we understand how the wood frog did it. We're still trying to figure out what it means to have everlasting life. But I hope that you'll think about it and wonder and remember every time you hear that call. Now, they only call during the spring, during um, that kind of just very tail end of winter. They may have already stopped calling in many places. But your homework is to go with an adult and Google a picture of a wood frog and practice identifying them. And then maybe you'll find one out in the woods. And then you'll be reminded then too, because they're there. You just need to watch and listen and remember. Our first scripture reading this morning is from 1 John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The word of life. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you that what we have seen and heard, or sorry, <laughs> we declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
Our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. I will read verses 13 through 23. Listen for the Word of God. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And now verses 24 through 35. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? The same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed as he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. God of Easter, breathe new life into our hearts. Renew our hope and refresh our faith during the sacred moment of meditation on your word. In the name of the risen Lord, we make this prayer. Amen. We're not our hearts burning within us. This is one of my favorite lines in the Gospels. The two heartbroken disciples sit at the table on the evening of the first Easter Sunday with someone they thought was a complete stranger. But when the risen Christ takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives a piece of the bread to Cleopas, 
and to his traveling companion, who is most likely Cleopas' wife, Mary, their eyes are opened. In that sacred moment at the table, the same disciples who had left Jerusalem with their hopes in tatters recognized the presence of the living Christ in their midst. The absurd rumors that they had heard earlier that day about the empty tomb turned into a profound spiritual awareness of the resurrection. This Easter supper, supper time is a deeply personal and life-changing experience for the grief-stricken disciples who had thought that the crucifixion meant that Jesus could not be the Messiah who would redeem Israel. They walked away from Jerusalem believing that it had been a mistake to follow Jesus, to place their hope on the new kingdom Jesus proclaimed, and to trust that Jesus would be different from all the other would-be messiahs before him who also said that they would liberate Israel only to end up dead on a Roman cross. Cleopas and his companion were crushed by what had happened to their beloved rabbi, but they were also feeling let down. The road to Emmaus was a journey fraught with a sense of defeat and delusionment. I imagine that the true disciples couldn't help but ask themselves how things could have gone so awfully wrong. Their sadness, disorientation, and confusion are so overwhelming that they see the mysterious stranger who joins them in their walk, but they do not recognize him right away. Instead, they go on talking about how all the signs seem to be right. How Jesus of Nazareth was a prophet, powerful in speech and action, in the sight of God and all the people. But then, betrayal, arrest, crucifixion between two thieves near the city dump, and death on Good Friday brought an end to all their dreams. The disciples on the road to Emmaus knew exactly what they expected Jesus to accomplish. They had grown up reading the Torah and the prophets. Israel's redemption would be a new exodus. The Messiah would bring God's people together, rekindle the fire of love for God's law in their hearts, and would lead the faithful in a military revolt against Rome. Once the pagan hordes were driven away from the land, Israel would be finally free. The scriptures would be fulfilled. They thought that this would be the ending Jesus would give them, not the cross. The cross was an embarrassment. Not only the book of Deuteronomy made it quite clear that a crucified person was under God's curse, but it was also unthinkable that God's anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, would suffer and die such a shameful and humiliating death. The reason Christ listens attentively to his two friends, he gives them a time to speak about their aspirations and name their immense sense of loss and hopelessness. The living Christ makes space for Cleopas and his companion to remember the difficult events of the last three days and say out loud that a story about angels and an empty tomb was not what they were expecting to hear on that first day of the week. Then Christ reinterprets the scriptures and invites his friends to open their hearts and minds to a new understanding of what God was doing through his life, through his death, through this young man of Nazareth, from Nazareth. Somehow, even though Cleopas and his unnamed companion do not realize it at the time, in his reinterpretation of scriptures and tradition, Christ opens their eyes to a truth far bigger than their sorrow and broken hearts. His life and faith, Christ says, were, were, were never meant to build an army of religious freedom fighters. 
His ministry was never about beating up the nation's enemies. His suffering and death on the cross were not an incontrovertible proof of the triumph of violence and injustice, but the beginning of a new hope, a new life, a new life-affirming faith movement in human history. Christ tells his disciples that Easter is what God had in mind all along. When they, they arrive in Emmaus, the two disciples simply cannot let go of this stranger. So they ask him to spend the night as their guest. Then at the dinner table, something odd happens. The guest unceremoniously assumes the role of the host, taking, blessing, breaking, and giving out the bread. And it is in the intimacy of that very human and very sacred moment of communion that Cleopas and possibly his wife Mary see Jesus, not as the stranger, but as the risen Lord. At the table, their grief turns into hope, their disappointment changes into joy, and their Easter faith makes them eager to regather with the other disciples back in Jerusalem to tell them how the resurrection came into their lives as a gift when they, when they least expected it and transformed their lives, their hearts, the way they saw the future. The reason Christ vanishes as soon as the two followers recognize him leaving Cleopas and his companion with nothing more than the words that have fascinated me since I first sat down to study this passage with the youth group of my church in Brazil. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scripture to us? I love the, that the Easter faith in this story comes as a gift. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus were not at all looking for Jesus or even expecting to feel his presence in their hearts. The faith that is grounded in the resurrection is not a product of theological education or recitation of the historical creeds of the church or memorization of Bible verses. The Easter faith is not the result of daily Bible reading or the intellectual struggle to make the mystery of the resurrection more palatable and acceptable. The Easter faith, the Gospel of Luke tells us, is a gift freely given by God, a gift that lights the fire of the Easter faith in our hearts. In fact, I like the translation of the words Cleopas and his companion exchange in the Good News version of the New Testament. They said to each other, wasn't it like a fire burning in us when he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? The late Dutch Reform, uh, Roman Catholic priest, Henry Noun, once made the bold claim that sometimes God uses other people to kindle this fire of faith in our hearts. Sometimes the gift of faith comes through a pastor or a youth advisor or a confirmation mentor or a deacon or a stranger who challenges us to stop believing what we think is there in the Bible or in our tradition and let the living Christ give us a deeper, richer, wider, and bigger understanding of the Easter faith. Sometimes, someone has to make our hearts burn. The most recent Gallup poll that was released last March at the beginning of Holy Week did not set any religious hearts ablaze. For the first time in 80 years, the percentage of Americans who consider themselves members of a religious institution church, synagogue, mosque, or temple fell below 50%. The polling also found that fewer Americans belong to a church. Only 64% of U.S. adults who indicated a religious preference 
still hold membership in a congregation, while 48% stated that religion is no longer relevant to them. Unsurprisingly, the Gallup's data shows a strong correlation between church attendance and generational divides. Old Americans or older Americans, especially those born before 1946, as well as baby boomers, are far more likely to be a church member than Generation Xers and Millennials. This means that a growing number of churches have a much older and actually wider profile than the U.S. population in general, a trend that not only creates challenges for church growth, but also portends further decline in church membership in the near future. As the Gallup's findings began to circulate on the internet and pop up on social media platforms, the attempts to explain the percentage drop in church affiliation grew louder. Some pointed their finger at the rise of a secular culture that is antagonistic to faith. Others said that the precipitous fall in the church membership is primarily an issue among predominantly white churches, since immigrants, black, and multi-ethnic congregations are still growing somewhat. A few believe that the growth of the religious unaffiliated and indifferent is an allergic reaction among millennials and the iGen toward organized religion as a whole. But an uncanny majority of Christian leaders turned their eyes to the institutional church itself and acknowledged that much of the damage the church has sustained is, in fact, self-inflicted. Bold prophets say that the issues such as sex scandals in the Roman Catholic Church and the unqualified support evangelicals have given to far-right ideologies have shattered the church from within. Many of these outspoken church leaders have talked up openly about how white Christian nationalism and the evangelical and Catholic hostility toward the LGBT community and racial justice have contributed to the increase of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, those who are religiously unaffiliated, but also of the duns, D-O-N-E-S, older Americans who were once active in the church, but who lost faith in an institution whose scandals and abuses make a mockery of the Christ of the Gospels. The way to bring people back to the church, many of these same courageous Christian leaders claim, is to reach out to all the disaffected, heartbroken, disillusioned, and alienated people who left and show them that there are still hundreds of congregations throughout the country that are doing everything possible to embody and practice God's radical and extravagant and inclusive love. The truth, however, is that even the churches that have risked everything to put the extravagant love of God into action, even those churches that have taken a stand against injustice and spoken up against racism, even the congregations that have reached out to younger Americans and have managed to preach the gospel in a language that makes sense to people who have not grown up in the Christian tradition, even these churches are not growing at the same pace as the nuns and the duns. And I wonder if that is something else going on in the church that is not making people's hearts burn with the hope and excitement and joy of the Easter faith. Padraig Otuyama, an Irish theologian and writer, said very wisely that good writing is when we read something we've always known but never been able to put into words. This is exactly how I felt when I came upon the heart-burning words of the Reverend Sam Wells, who serves as the vicar at the St. Martin in the Fields Church in London. Reverend Wells said very eloquently and audaciously that the church needs to repent, to repent 
because we have turned Christ into nothing more than a, a ladder that we want to use to get us from the ground to the roof, from this life to heaven, from sin to forgiveness, from this transitory existence to life eternal. We have instrumentalized Jesus. The whole Christian tradition that still insists on pushing the belief that all we have to do is to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior and then use our confession as an entry ticket to heaven turns Jesus into a means to an end. We use him for comfort, for peace, for shelter, for blessings, for forgiveness of sins and communion with God. But in doing so, we have reduced our relationship with the living Christ to a transactional process where God gives us special blessings and salvation as long as we do not look around for a more reliable way to get up the roof, to the roof. Sam Wells reminds the church that Jesus died on the cross, emptying himself of everything but love. And he was raised on Easter morning because God's love is stronger than death and nothing can separate us from that life-giving love. The resurrection was not meant to be a, the final theological proof that Jesus is the right instrument to get us to heaven. Easter affirms the life that Jesus lived. The emptiness of the tomb reveals that nothing Jesus ever did or said was lost, forgotten, or destroyed by the powers of this world. The Easter faith saves us because it changes the way we live in the most fundamental way. Easter is not just about believing that Jesus overcame death. The resurrection inspired us to look at the world through the lenses of God's love, a love that is so powerful and truthful that nothing can stand on its way. That is no circumstance in our lives, no situation in the world, no bad news about the state of the institutional church, no di diagnosis, no virus, no heartbreaking shooting, no sin or mistake. That is nothing that can keep God away from us or us from God's love. Christ lives, so we would not forget that that is indeed life after the resurrection, a life that wants nothing more than to be in a loving relationship with God, the essence of our very beings, the maker of every single one of us, the creator of everything we love. What the Bible calls heaven is an unambiguous, uninhibited, unconstrained, genuine relationship with God through Christ and a true friendship with our neighbors and a renewed sense of care for God's creation. The Easter faith is the way God found to tell you and me that God hopes we will love God with all our hearts and strength and we will enjoy Christ so deeply that in this loving relationship we will find the true purposeful and meaningful life that never runs out. I don't think the theology that still paddles Christ as an instrument to get sinners to heaven can make hearts burn with the fire of the Easter faith. I don't think anyone is looking for a transactional Christian spirituality anymore. The amazing thing that is happening in our lifetime is that people no longer feel that they have to attend church or subscribe to church dogmas and doctrines to love God. In fact, going to church has become a fringe movement. And this is the perfect moment for Christians to share our Easter faith with the world, to tell people that God, the God of Easter, lives in our hearts to let people know that the God of Easter faith does not live in a heavenly throne far from our reality or in cathedrals set apart from the rest of our daily lives or in theologies that no longer make human hearts burn or even in hymns or sermons, but in the world where at any time a stranger can completely change the way we understand scriptures and a moment as ordinary as eating together with a guest becomes a holy moment that lights 
the fire of faith in our hearts. This is the perfect time for the church to stop worrying about the numbers of people in the pews and members on the membership role and dare to believe that the Easter faith can still make hearts burn. All we have to do is to get out and walk with people. Be part of their journeys rather than expect them to come to our buildings. Give them a sacred space where they can talk about their doubts and question what they believe. Have the courage to tell them about the scriptures and stories that shape our faith. Be intentional about making strangers our guests and talk to them about this life that never runs out and about this Easter faith that makes us so madly in love with human life that we can't help but keep quarreling with the world over the shootings and the hate and the racism and the injustices and about everything else that keeps people from living the full life that the resurrection promises and offers. For almost 40 years now, I have been attending church services, and I have treasured every moment when someone has made my heart burn. God knows I would not have lasted long in the church if I had not experienced in the unlikeliest of moments and in the most unexpected places the love of God and the life-giving power of the Eastern faith. Without making hearts burn, the church loses its meaning, its vitality, its energy. Without retelling the story of Easter and breaking bread together, without a deep wonder, sense of wonder for the, the word and the sacraments, the church loses itself in the fight for institutional survival and political power and social relevance. But the church's most important call is still is to make human hearts burn with gratitude and joy for the unstoppable power of God's love to give us the Easter faith as a gift and to raise us to full life. Poet Donna Markova wrote a poem that I believe captures the essence of what Easter and this heartburn mission of the church is about. The title of her poem is, I Will Not Die an Unlived Life. I will not die an unlived life. I will not live in fear of falling and catching fire. I choose to inhabit my days, to allow my living to open me, to make me less afraid, more accessible, to loosen my heart until I become a wing, a torch, a promise. I choose to risk my significance, to live so that which came to me as a seed goes to the next as a blossom, and that which came to me as a blossom goes on as fruit. I honestly believe that while the world may not be lining up in front of church buildings to come in and attend the uh, Sunday services, or perhaps given the pandemic, I should say that people are not waking up on Sunday morning and rushing to their computers to log on to Facebook to worship. That is still a real hunger for a meaningful life. Americans may have left organized religion, but most Americans still consider themselves spiritual and want to meet someone or something that makes their hearts burn with a real passion for life, for truth, for love, for friendship, for justice, for community, for Christ, for God. I doubt very much that people are interested in a theology that instrumentalizes Jesus. But I do believe many still want to feel their hearts burning with God's love. They're just not sure if the church wants to make space for their spiritual search, journey and, journey and longing. There are many people who are not satisfied with their unbelief and would love to meet someone who would listen and give them a chance to hear about <clears throat> the resurrection. 
how it makes us less afraid, more accessible, how Easter loosens our heart and empowers us to offer our lives as a blossom or a fruit to one another. I believe most people, even those, those who, have, um, who say they have an allergic reaction to the church, would love to know that there are still followers of the risen Christ who, like St. John, have the courage to say what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, we declare to you. Imagine. Imagine what would happen if the church became the sacred place where we do hear, see, touch, and declare to one another how the resurrection, the Easter faith, is a tangible gift that changes our lives, makes our hearts burn, and empowers us to live with so much love for God and Christ, our neighbors, and our planet, that whatever comes to us as seed goes to the next as blossom. And whatever can't come to us as blossom goes as fruit, as a gift of faith, a promise of the life that never runs out. Imagine, imagine if our church right here in Acton was committed above everything else to make hearts burn, burn with the joy and the love of Easter. Imagine. May all your hearts burn with a renewed passion for Christ, for God, and for our neighbors today. May it be so. Amen.
Although this morning we are spread out over the face of this earth, let our hearts now be joined together in the spirit of prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you for your presence this morning during our time of worship. Now, in our time of sacred prayer, we join our hearts together and open them before you. Fill our hearts, we pray, with your peace and wisdom, with your love and mercy. In this season of Easter, resurrect our spirits and strengthen our faith. In this season of springtime, we pray that the seeds of your word might bloom and flourish within us. Help us to share your love and beauty with all of creation like the flowering plants around us. Your creation amazes and inspires us. And we remember that you are the God of spring flowers and spring snows, that you are with us in times of joy and in times of sorrow. You share with us both a spark of hope and the pangs of injustice. And we pray for the courage, O oh God, to nurture your loving spirit here on earth, to bring your light to places of darkness, healing to the sick, comfort to those who mourn, rest for the weary, hope for the hopeless, sight for the blind, release to the captives. We come before you, God, each of us, asking for help, asking for grace. We come before you praying for healing, healing for Kevin, healing for Ibit, healing for George Olson and his family, for Zachary, for Vicki for Deanna and George Downs, for Ryan, for Roy, Nancy, and Karen. God, we come before you this morning praying for our nation, our world, and all of those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19, for all of those who continue to fight it still. And God, we pray for our congregation for all the people all around the world who continue to worship virtually as we try to stay connected in faith and spirit through this time of distance and isolation. God, we lift all these prayers up to you along with these silent meditations of our own hearts. Oh God, hear our prayer as we say together the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as you go back into the world and enjoy this beautiful day that the Lord has made, I invite you to take some time to think, when was it that you felt 
your heart burning? When was it that in the church or in talking to a friend, you felt the presence of the living Christ and it was so powerful and transformative that you felt the fire of the Easter faith lighting in your heart? This is where we're called to experience. This is where we're called to share with one another. So may your heart be burning this week. May you have many sacred moments where you do meet the risen Christ and remember why we have chosen to believe in this gift of life that never runs out. And with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and throughout this week. Amen.